you know, life is all about perspective. And the truth is, sometimes we can be our own worst critic. We've been studying about God's exceptional choices over the past few weeks, how God used certain Bible characters to do amazing things. And it can be easy to see how God might use a Abraham or a Jacob or a Gideon to do some amazing task, but we don't always see ourselves as doing something amazing. Well, today, it's all about you. Today, you are God's exceptional choice. And I wanna let you know, God doesn't make mistakes. God knows everything about us from the beginning of time, the good, the bad, and everything in between, and God still chose you. And I want to let you know that God not only chose you, but he set aside blessings just for you. Listen, we've got an amazing lesson. I'm excited as always. Let's see what God has for us. So with today's lesson, we are shifting gears just a little bit. We've, we've been in the Old Testament the, the past couple of weeks. We've been studying about Abraham and Gideon, uh, about Jacob and Saul and King David and all these remarkable characters. Well, we're jumping in the New Testament with today's lesson. We're still in the same theme. We're still studying God's exceptional choice. Uh, but today we get to dive into one of uh, one of the Pauline epistles. And I got to tell you, I'm excited. Um, I'm excited about uh, just this passage of scripture. Um, it, it, it's hard not to be excited about the book of Ephesians. It's, it's, a, it's a great book. Um, it's got a lot of good information in it. And um, so we're kind of just going to dive right into it since we're opening up with the first chapter. Just give you just a little bit of background around the book of Ephesians. Now, in the original text, uh, the, the city of Ephesus or the Ephesians people were not mentioned originally. So that was something that was actually got added later. And a lot of biblical scholars draw the conclusion because of that, that this was likely a circular letter, which means that this was a letter that Paul would have written, not necessarily to a specific church, but it was intended to be sent from the church of Ephesus to the church of Philippi, you know, to the church of Thessalonica, and just sent around to the different churches just to kind of give instruction. Um, and that's kind of why, if, if you know a little bit about the book of Ephesians, it's not addressing a specific issue. Most Pauline epistles, uh, he's he's addressing something that's going on. He either got wind of something or he personally, you know, witnessed something and he wrote a letter to try to address what's going on. Like the book of Corinthians, the, the you know, the people in Corinthians were in Corinth were being heavily influenced by Greek culture. And a lot of that was affecting their doctrine. And it was, was you know, it was swaying some of the things that they believed about Jesus Christ. And that's when Paul had to write, you know, and say, come out from among them and be separate, you know. So usually Paul is addressing a specific issue, but not so in the book of Ephesians. Uh, in this book, he spends the first kind of three chapters just describing some some doctrine issues, some doctrines uh, that we should believe. And then he spends the last three chapters talking about the application of those, some of those doctrines in what we believe as Christians. So. Um, it's it's a really uh, concise, it's a compact book, um, but full of a lot of really good information. You know, um, the Church of Ephesus or the city of Ephesus was really centralized in the Roman Empire. It was located in Asia Minor, which was in modern day Turkey. Um, so because it was probably one of the more major cities in that area, that's why a lot of scholars conclude that this book was given the name Ephesus because that or Ephesians because that would have been probably the main city, you know, in in that area. But circular in nature, um, which was something that was common in ancient times, you would have something that was called an imperial edict, and um, that was a ruler's way of getting information disseminated throughout the empire. Now. You might be surprised to know, but they didn't have the internet 
in ancient times. So if they wanted to get information out to the masses, they would have to write an official letter, you know, put the uh, king's or the imperial's name, seal, uh, face on it, some kind of way to identify it, and then they would send it from city to city to outpost to outpost and it would be read uh, by officials and then it would go out to the local communities and that's how they would send out important information well paul you know being a roman citizen uh he would be very familiar with roman culture and use some of their natural uh institutions in order to facilitate uh, you know this this fledgling christian church uh so he used that uh, as a means to, to write letters um it is believed that Paul wrote this while he was in prison, you know, during during the, the latter end of Paul's ministry, uh, he was in prison. If you read about, uh, I believe it's in Acts chapter 21, Paul got arrested when he was going to do ministry in Jerusalem. And uh, we, we had a lesson a few weeks ago about a miracle on Malta, and that was Paul traveling from Caesarea to Rome, and he he crashed into the uh, to the Isle of Malta on his way to Rome. But when he finally got to Rome, he was placed on house arrest, and he was there for quite a few years. Um, he wrote a few books while he was there. He wrote the book of Philemon. Uh, he wrote the book of Ephesians. He wrote the uh, book of uh, Philippians, and he wrote the book of Colossians. So he did all of this while he was on house arrest, and then of course, kind of near the end of that, he would have he would have written. Uh, first and second Timothy as well, um, because as he got near the the end of his life and near in, in near the end of his ministry, he was kind of sowing those those last seeds into Timothy, and that's when he was saying things like, you know, I've fought the good fight and I finished my course, and he was in a sense passing the mantle uh, to Timothy at that time. So we we've got we've got an amazing uh, book on our hands. We got an amazing lesson. So let's jump right into the beginning verses and just begin to unpack. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, and peace, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So this book opens up in a very traditional Paul fashion, when he identifies himself as an apostle. Uh, interestingly enough, not just Pauline letters are structured this way. Uh, if you study any type of ancient letters around this time, usually the sender of the letter identifies himself at the beginning of the letter, which is the opposite of modern letters. In most modern letters, the sender identifies themselves at the end. They'll write the letter and then they'll say, sincerely, you know, Paul the Apostle, and they'll identify the recipient at the beginner. But uh, in traditional ancient letter fashion, the sender is identifying the himself as beginning and Paul is identifying himself as the apostle he's establishing himself or just reaffirming himself which is something that he he would want to do and need to do in many of his letters because when he's writing these letters it's usually a church that he's established and it's been some time since he's appeared in person and he's trying to reaffirm his authority he's trying to he's trying to shore up and just uh put himself in a position to where he can address certain topics. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 8, Paul writes, he says, And last of all, he was seen of me. Who is he? We're talking about Jesus Christ, specifically the risen Savior. He's saying he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 was talking about all the people who had witnessed the risen Savior and he had went through and talked about how the apostles had seen him. But then he had also said that he, when he was saying one born out of due time, he was saying that he did not physically see Jesus, but he saw Jesus through a vision in Acts chapter 9, verse 5, he said, uh, it says, and he said, who art thou? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So uh, Paul is as always reaffirming his, his apostolic position as one who has seen the risen Savior. But understand this, by definition, the word apostle simply means sent out. So he's saying that he was sent out, maybe outside of the four walls, sent out to do what? To establish the faith, to establish church structure, to establish church government. And the uh, the church of Ephesus 
would have been a church that uh, Paul either established or that he refortified maybe after somebody like an Aquila and Priscilla had maybe established it. But um, Act, the book of Acts is very clear to say that Paul spent some three years pastoring this church. So these are people that uh, he would have been very familiar with. And he's writing to a group of people that he has some rapport with. So he's saying that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul says something interesting. He says to the saints. Now, this may come across like really subtle, but understand in the Old Testament, the word saints is something exclusive to the Jews. So again, the church of Ephesus, it's not just Jews, but it has Gentiles there. And when he's saying that there are saints, Paul is doing something very big and he's doing something very intentional in saying that all that believe in Jesus Christ are saints. Well, what does it mean to be a saint? By definition, a saint uh, um, is someone who is holy someone who's sanctified, someone who's consecrated. So rather than saying those three things, saying that I'm holy and I'm set apart and I'm sanctified, which means that you're purified and then consecrated means uh, set aside for the purpose of God, you would just simply say, I'm, I'm a saint, you know? And uh, that puts Christianity in a, in a very different basket, you know, particularly in contrast maybe to the Jewish faith, but also to, to Roman Catholicism because, uh, you know, uh, as far as the Roman Catholic Church is concerned, they only have certain individuals that they identify as, as saints, and there's certain rules and stipulations, uh, but one thing we do know is that you, you have to be dead <laughs> before they qualify you as a saint, but that's not uh, according to our Christian faith. You don't have to be dead to be a saint, Paul is writing to people that are alive and he's saying that they are saints there at Ephesus, uh, meaning that it's just a person who is pure, set aside for the work of God. Um, so then he goes on to say, saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So this is letting us know that he's not just writing to the people at Ephesus, but he's writing this letter to a much larger audience, which again speaks to how this, this letter was likely a circular letter that would have went out to uh, several churches there in Asia Minor. So then Paul goes on to use a very uh, traditional phrase in verse number two when he says, grace be to you and peace from God our Father. This is not a statement. This is a prayer. This, this, is, this is an acknowledgement to whoever would read this and receive this. He's saying grace and peace to that person. So he's praying that over their lives. Again, this is something that you see uh, a lot in, in Pauline letters, but certainly in ancient times, this was a typical greeting. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. In verse 3, uh, we are already getting in some exciting territory because the verse is telling us that God has spiritual blessings for us and not just spiritual blessings, but blessings that are in heavenly places. Now, Paul is going to spend uh, a good portion of not only this chapter, but a good portion of the book of Ephesians kind of articulating and explaining to us what these spiritual blessings are, you know, and that's exciting. You know, I, I, I hope that that's, that stirs your spirit to know that, that God not only made provisions for us to be redeemed and for us to be saved, which we're going to get into later on in the text, but God blessed us, which means that God is setting us up to give us everything that we need to have good success into him, but to have a, a, a wonderful experience in God throughout all eternity. You know, um, one thing that is so critical to, to, to point out to this is that it is spiritual blessings in heavenly places, not natural blessings in earthly places, you know? And uh, I always like to speak to the culture <laughs> when, when, I, when I do these lessons, you know, because when we talk about being God's exceptional choice, you know, in order for you to really appreciate what it means to be chosen by God, you know, we, we have to have an appetite for spiritual things. Amen. You know, and if, if you don't have an appetite for spiritual things, it can be hard to really appreciate the love of God. You know, that's a very 
popular book out right now. It's called The Five Love Languages. If you don't have it and you're married or you're in a serious relationship, I encourage you to pick that book up. But one of the things that the book mentions in The Five Love Languages is it talks about how there can be a miscommunication in love languages. You have to love somebody in a way that they can understand that you are loving them. So if it's a person that, you know, their love language is uh, words of affirmation, well, you have to use words of affirmation in order for them to receive the fact that they're being loved. Sometimes I wonder, do we as Christians, as modern day contemporary Christians, do we understand the love language of God? Sometimes I wonder that because uh, when, when you hear preaching and you hear prophecies and it, all of it is in this natural secular realm, how people are prophesying cars and prophesying money and, you know, promotions and all this natural stuff, that stuff is well and good. But understand, God is trying to give us spiritual blessings uh, that not only have a spiritual benefit, but that are in heavenly places. Why? So that they can last. God wants to bless you with things that are going to impact you today and stay in your life for all of eternity. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Jesus was preaching. He said, lay not up for yourselves treasures here on earth where the moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. Verse number 20, it says, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now, look, I'm, I'm not speaking against anybody who wants to go out and accomplish something in life you know i mean i, I went to school uh, you can't see it in this shot right here I, I went and got a master's degree you know I, I i'm pursuing a career and i'm trying to do everything i can in this natural life but i want you to understand our priorities is in heavenly places Amen. I mean, a good job is nice. Making money is nice. But like the saints, <laughs> like the saints of old used to sing, can't nobody do you like Jesus. Amen. So the only things that's going to really provide that that satisfying uh, uh, feeling that, that you are eternally loved are spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And that's what Paul is trying to, in a sense, he's trying to whet our appetites here at the beginning of this letter to let us know that this is something that God has for us. And then if you, if you, you see there's, there's a colon there at the end of verse three, which means he's about to go on and start explaining this stuff, which is what we're going to see in, in some of the verses to come. Now, verse number four, uh, a very pivotal word. I'm actually surprised verse number four is not the key text because the word chosen is in there. That's the first time that we're seeing the word chosen in, in this passage, but it's saying that according as he, he being God, hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. What does it mean to be chosen or what does it mean that that God has made a choice? Well, I want you to understand there are three elements to God's choice or to God choosing you. Number one, it means that God had a multiplicity of options. When God chose us as believers he was not limited in his options. You know, if, if you went to go buy a car and you, and you didn't have a car and you went to a car lot and there was only one car in the car lot, you'd take that car. You'd be like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not walking anymore. But there would be a sense of unsatisfaction. You might even have buyer's remorse at one point because you'd be like, man, I, did, I really didn't have much of a choice. It was the only car in the car lot. Well, what scripture is telling us that when God chose us, it's telling us that everything in all of creation in both heaven and earth, it all belongs to God. God has choices. God has options. And with all the options that God had, God chose you. Now that look, that ought to make you feel some way about yourself. You ought to feel special to know that in all of God's options, he chose you. Not only that, did God uh, have options, but God was not being forced in any particular direction. You know, when, when you are able to make a choice free of outside influence, you, you are insulated. Nobody can tell you what to choose. You know, uh, I, I imagine, you know, some of us like myself, when we were younger, 
and maybe we were making certain decisions about where we would go to school. Yeah, it's a blessing to go to school, but your parents may have heavily influenced that decision. They may have been like, no, you need to stay in state so that we can pay in state tuition, things like that. Like you're making a choice, but your choice is being influenced by outside voices. When God makes a choice, nobody's telling God what to do. God is the alpha and the omega. God is the king of kings. God is the supreme authority. There's nobody telling God what to do. So if God chose you, understand that that was a divine decision. So God had options. God was not being forced to choose anything. And the last thing I want you to understand is that if God chose you, that means God has access to you. Ooh. Because, you know, it's one thing to make a decision to have a desire for something. But if you make a decision that is inaccessible, that's inaccessible, well, you you go to a burger and fry restaurant and you try to order lasagna. Well, I mean, that's that's a choice, but you don't have access to that choice. When God chose us, he has access access to me you you are where god can get to you god can reach you where you're at you know sometimes we go through things in life and i'm not trying to park too long here but you know sometimes especially before we give our life to god and maybe we've gone through some very hurtful some very painful experiences and we're coming to god and we think that we are unworthy of god and and we feel like maybe we're in a place that is unredeemable i want you to know that god chose you it tells us in this scripture as a matter of fact it says before the foundation of the world god chose you you are accessible right where you are, right what you've gone through. I don't care what it was. You know, people may have a hard time wrapping their minds around God redeeming you, but it is a simple thing to God. It is, it is a light thing to God. God would love nothing more than to redeem you. Amen. So God has chosen us which means that he had access to us. He wasn't influenced by outside voices. And not only that, but God had a multiplicity of options and God chose you. I wanna say this about verse four before we move forward because some people get hung up on the, the before the foundation of the world and they think that that is the purpose of the choice that he chose before the foundation of the world. The purpose of the choosing is so that we would be holy and without blame. I want you to get that. God chose you, why? So that we should be holy and without blame. Now unto him who was able to keep us from falling and present us faultless. Listen, God wants us to be holy and without blame. That is God's choice for our lives. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. So we have not really addressed the elephant in the room up to this point, uh, and that elephant is called Calvinism. Uh, It's no secret that Ephesians chapter one is really one of the principal passages of scripture that the Calvinist belief used to ground uh, their, their belief system. So uh, in that verse number five, with the, with the word predestinated, you know, um, that, is, that is one of their one of their big trigger words, if you will. Uh, if you're less familiar with uh, Calvinism, I, I'm going to kind of just briefly touch on the five points of Calvinism. Uh, we're not going to do an in-depth study because that's definitely what what this what this lesson is about, but I find that if you understand what other people believe, even if you don't believe it, it helps draw clear lines in your own understanding. It helps shore up your own theology by understanding why other people believe uh, because scripture says that iron sharpens iron. (laughs) It doesn't mean that that iron has to believe the same thing that you believe. It just means that it needs to be iron. So, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch I'm gonna touch on this and um, I might link a video uh, to maybe a pastor that's gonna kind of really dive into this if you want to do some more research on it but the five points of Calvinism the the acronym is tulip um, some of you might be familiar with that number one is total depravity 
Uh, total depravity means that man is inherently evil uh, and that man, man uh, is inherently sinful and in need of redemption, which um, isn't a hard concept to agree with. Number two is unconditional election. Now, this is one of the challenging concepts of uh, of Calvinism because what it's saying is that uh, people who are redeemed uh, were determined to be saved from the beginning of time and there's nothing that they needed to do and there's nothing they can do about it. So in other words, the idea behind Calvinism is that when we're saying that people are predestinated is that there's a fixed number out there that God said that this number of people are going to be saved. Number two is limited atonement, which means that in a sense that salvation isn't available for everybody. Yikes. Uh, I is irresistible grace. It's saying for those that were predestinated and chosen to go to heaven, um, they can't help but receive the grace of God because the grace of God is irresistible and God is going to save them whether they like it or not. And then of course, those who are not predestinated and not chosen, uh, they can't be saved uh, no matter how much you witness to them, no matter how much you preach to them, no matter you know what it is that they believe. If they're not predestinated, they're not going to heaven. And then uh, the P is the preservation of saints, uh, which essentially goes into the once saved, always saved, saying that no matter what uh, the elect or whatever, no matter what the, those who are predestinated do, they're still going to heaven. Uh, and that is the belief of, of the Calvinistic faith, which which really rests against what's going on here in Ephesians chapter one, verse five. Now, I want you to understand something that just because the word predestinated is there it does not mean that god intended for a certain number of people to go to heaven and a certain number of people to go to hell where am i getting that from well the bible talks about in matthew chapter 25 verse 41 it says then shall he say unto them on the left depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire get this prepared for the devil and his angels so scripture is very clear that hell was not created with mankind in mind the hell was created for the devil and his angels this is what god intended for people that uh were being used by satan and satan himself to work against the kingdom of god Revelations chapter 22, verse 17, it says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. This means that salvation is available to everybody whosoever will it's not restricted for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him whosoever it's it's not it's not restrictive it's it's not denying any certain people's access but it's saying that whoever comes to faith to many as believe on them them gave you the power to come to become the sons of god if you have faith and you want to utilize that faith that God has given you, well, salvation is available to you. So this is not saying, so God in his, in his infinite love, saying that uh, he has predestinated us unto the adoption. So this is it, only, the word, only thing we should understand from the word predestinate is that this was God's intent from the beginning. And, and what should be a, a beautiful concept, unfortunately, it is, it is made ugly and it is distorted. But what, what Paul is trying to let believers know is that God always had it in mind to send his son. He always had it in mind for Gentiles to be saved. God always had it in mind that his covenant would be extended to all humanity. You know, even though that God's covenant originated in the Old Testament exclusively with the Jews, this is letting us know that it was predestined from the beginning that God would extend himself to everybody. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself. Adoption is huge, particularly in Roman culture. Because in Roman culture or in ancient culture, children were property. Children could be sold into slavery. 
they could be killed. Ancient times, you could just kill your child and you wouldn't have to answer for it. It was your child. So understand that if a father decides to adopt a child, understand that, that is, they are being brought into a privileged position to where they are with, with no equivocations a part of the family. And, understand, and what is inherent that if someone is choosing to adopt you and bring you into the fold, that there's some love there, that there's some good intention there, that 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 uh, that that there is some some hopeful future associated with being adoption. How do we know that it's a hopeful future? Well, look at this. It says according to his good pleasure or according to the good pleasure of his will. It is the good pleasure of God's will that at from the beginning of time that you would be adopted and to brought into his faith. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted. We, we would not be accepted had it not been for the grace of God. There's no way, for by grace we are saved and not of our own works, lest any man should boast. He said, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence scripture is telling us in verse 7 that we have been redeemed by the blood of jesus this is a financial term this literally means to be purchased out of slavery we have been redeemed by the blood. Now, this is something that uh, Paul goes into extensively in, in the book of Romans, particularly in Romans chapter six, where he talks about that when we were uh, unregenerated, that we were slaves to sin. But then he said in Romans six and 18, and then being made free from sin, we should be the, the servants of righteousness. In other words, we were, we were slaves to sin, but now having been redeemed, bought by, by the blood of Jesus, purchased our got our freedom scripture tells us in turn become a servant or a slave to the righteousness of god so this is telling us it, it, is, it is a remarkable concept because when you talk about redemption you're talking about a, a debt that is owed you know if, if you go to a store and you have a coupon and that coupon is a you know 20 percent off coupon when you use that coupon they say that you're redeeming that coupon, right? That literally means that that coupon is a debt that the business owes you. They, they owe you that money. They, they owe you that discount. So and, 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 uh, if you've got an accounting background, you know that honestly coupons are a, considered a liability uh, to a business. It's actually recorded as a liability because it's a debt instrument. So when you talk about redemption, you're talking about a debt being paid. Jesus paid a debt for us, a debt that we could not pay for ourselves. He bought us out of slavery. It says the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Wow. This is, this is everything that's being done. We, we understand we're, we're still stemming from verse number three, where it talks about spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Understand that one of the spiritual blessings that God has for us is his grace. The riches of his grace. Wow. God, the, the, the abundance and the, the, the purchasing power of God's grace. It is wealthy. That's amazing. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Another spiritual blessing in heavenly places is wisdom and prudence. Scripture says, if any man lacketh wisdom, do what? Let him ask of God who gives liberally. God, God is not stingy with the wisdom that he gives us but this all comes as a result of god's grace it all comes a result of god wanting to bless us with spiritual blessings having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So in verse nine, Paul is, wow, he's writing about an amazing blessing. We're talking about spiritual blessings when we talk about the mysteries, the mysteries of God's will. 
because understand that the, the, the knowledge of the kingdom is privileged information. This is something that not all of creation has access to. This is something that God has reserved for those who are exclusively his own, the, the, the mysteries of his will. And this is something that, that is spoken of through scripture, particularly in, in Paul's uh, epistles. If you look uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're just going to kind of touch on this a little bit, but looking at verse number seven, it says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So this again is speaking back to the wisdom of God that God has predestinated for us since the beginning of time. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew. He's talking about the enemies of the kingdom and the enemies of God that, that persecuted and crucified Jesus. He says, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew that by crucifying Jesus, it was a part of the redemptive plan of God, they never would have crucified him but too late. <laughs> so they crucified him. He's died on the cross. And now they have released the ultimate plan of God, which is at, up to that point was a mystery. But verse number nine says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, the things which God have prepared for them that love them. So it's almost, it's, it's letting us know that even as believers, God is revealing us so many things, but God really reveals things to us as we walk in him. And even some things we won't know until we get to glory. When we, when we see him, we should be like him. And that's when we will know literally all things. But until then, Many things are a mystery. Verse 10, it says, But God hath revealed uh, them, to, uh, them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. How is it that we can know the mysteries of God and receive this particular uh, uh, blessing that, that's in heavenly places? We, we do it through the Spirit. I'm going to do verse 14, and I'm, and I'm, I'm going to let this passage go, but read through this when you got a chance. Verse 14, it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Have you ever tried to explain a spiritual concept to somebody that was outside of the faith? It's, it's almost like you're just talking to a wall. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. And it's, it's, it's interesting to think that when you receive the revelation of these mysteries by the Spirit, even in your best effort to give it to people, they're spiritually discerned and they, and they, and they won't receive it. So, so this is this is one of these these particular blessings that verse three talks about these spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places, mysteries of God, the mysteries of His will. Back in Ephesians chapter one, looking at verse ten, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together. Understand, verse ten is telling us that there is an appointed time that God has really predestined that all of creation should be redeemed to him. It's both in heaven and in earth. So that uh, if, you, if you read any anything in the book of Revelations, you would read about the new Jerusalem and the new earth and that there's a point in time where God is going to redeem everything in creation to himself. Um, but verse 10 is a, is a very deep passage because it, it, when you use the word dispensation, it, it's showing that how God moves in times and seasons and is saying that everything that God does is strategic and it's calculated and it's all according to his divine will. In whom also we have an obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. In verse five, we had mentioned that we are adopted, but now in verse 11, we're moving to a place of inheritance. Understand an inheritance is something that's reserved 
for the children. So when it, we've, we've moved into a place now where we've been adopted into being the children of God, and now God is saying that there are provisions that are set aside exclusively for us by virtue of the fact that we are his children. We've, we've got an inheritance in God. Again, we are talking about spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I um, want to wanna point out to you just something that's very interesting is that not only does God have an inheritance with us, but scripture talks about how we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Amen. So it's not even like, we, you know, it's, it's, it can be awkward when you go to the reading of a will and, you know, certain people get some things and certain people get less things. And it's just like, oh, I guess I'm less loved because I didn't get as much as this person. But scripture is telling us that we, we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. In other words, saying that God is, is regarding us with the highest level of regard that he can regard his children. In, in Romans 8 and 16, it says, in the spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are, what? The children of God. And if children, then heirs. Of who? Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffering with him, we might we may also be glorified with him so this saying us that we we are joint heirs with jesus christ and as an heir we stand to inherit uh verse 11 said being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things uh after the counsel of his will counsel understand is is the knowledge and the understanding of god meaning that god is omniscient knowing all things and God, knowing all things, works all things according to his will. Everything that happens in our life, God is orchestrating it according to his will. All things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. And then finally, uh, in verse number 13, it says that ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Understand in ancient times anytime official documentation i want you to get this anytime official documentation was sent it was sealed wax and then the insignia of an official person was imprinted in that wax as a seal to establish authority to establish get this authenticity you know who it came from based on the seal that was on it we are sealed by the holy spirit how do people know that you belong to God because of the spirit that you operate under? I want you to get that. How do people know that the mark of God is on your life by, by how you live and you operate in the Holy Spirit? I want you to understand that a seal would normally have the image of whoever the seal belongs to. <laughs> it would have the image so when it tells us that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, it means that the image of God is impressed upon our lives. Look, this text is blessing me. It's, it's telling me that God puts his image in us through his spirit. And then verse 14, again, we're talking about, look, the, the blessings just keep going. They just keep going. These spiritual blessings in heavenly places being adopted. We got an inheritance. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 14, it's telling us that the Holy Spirit is just our earnest. It's it's our down payment. It's, it's just, it's not all that God has for us, but it's just, it's giving us uh, uh, something to hang our faith on. It's telling us, no, first of all, that the Holy Spirit came from heaven. It's got to be a substance of what is promised. And we are promised uh, we are promised spiritual blessings in heavenly places. So if our inheritance is in heaven and the spirit is a down payment or it's an earnest, that means the spirit came from heaven. You got a piece of heaven living on the inside of you. What a blessing. What, what what more can you ask for? How, how can a car or a house compare to a piece of heaven in the midst of your life? So it's saying that it's an earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. That means that when we get redeemed or that when God comes back to receive us, we will get the full inheritance that he has for us. Listen, I want you never to forget that you are God's 
exceptional choice. God chose some amazing people to do some amazing things in scripture and understand God chose you too. And that there are some remarkable things that God is doing through your life that he's going to continue to do through your life. And truly, the best is yet to come.